we have a wonderful God. <clears throat> and part of the purpose of meeting together is to remind each other of who we are and what our destination is and how we should occupy our time. Amen. To not be sluggish, but to learn to open our hearts and worship God in spirit and in truth. That's the job of the church. And uh, we want to pray that we get to learn to do it better and more. And bring our prayers, bring our requests, bring our longings, bring our sorrows, bring our joys and bring ourselves to, to our God who is all too, if I might use the word anxious, the wrong word, but he can't wait for his presence to be made known among his people. The Bible says he inhabits the praise of his people. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Well, we um, have started to look at... Um, a, a series which uh, I thought I was being original, calling it Encounters with Jesus. I thought I was being, um, well, it's, I guess I would say it's how the Lord uh, spoke to me in reading John's Gospel. Um, <clears throat> but I discovered a book in the last fortnight by a very well-known American preacher, and it's called Encounters with Jesus. And it is doing exactly the same thing. It's looking at how um, we use the phrase evangelist. We talk about people being street evangelists or personal evangelists. And there, there's a side to the life and work of Jesus, which um, I think is, is lovely. And it's shown in John's Gospel how Jesus went about encountering different people, all sorts of different people, and how that encounter completely changed their lives. And John's Gospel can be read that way. Yes, there were lots of interactions in more public places with the crowds and the, the feeding of the multitudes. They're, they're not so much in John's Gospel, but there are public encounters in John's Gospel, and they are more to do with um, a developing disagreement with the, with the people who were just religious, but who missed the truth of the Son of God. But John's Gospel can also be read as, as Jesus seeking out, searching, and finding lost sheep from all sorts of different backgrounds. And we looked last week at how um, a man called Nicodemus, uh, sorry, that's what we're looking at this week. We looked at last week at a man called Nathaniel and how um, despite all of his prejudices and, um, and mistaken ideas about uh, the, the little despised town that Jesus came from, nevertheless, his encounter with the Lord completely changed his worldview and his understanding. And very quickly, this man called Nathaniel said, you're the son of God. That was what he said. And Jesus told him, if you believe that, if you see that, there is so much more yet to come for you you will see heaven opened. Well, that was Nathaniel, And we looked at Mary and uh, how Jesus can sometimes, we, we get a wrong idea if we think of Jesus as always meek and mild. It's simply not true. <laughs> sometimes he was. But in these early chapters of John, we meet we meet. Another side of Jesus who, if he needed to talk straight, including to his mother, he did. Um, actually, it's not a personal encounter. 
But we then come in the story as John unfolds it of how Jesus and his disciples, remember they lived in the, in the Old Testament. Jesus lived in the Old Testament. So he followed certain rules and regulations and ways of living which are no longer necessary. But Jesus' life was spent in the Old Testament time. So when the time of year came around to visit um, Jerusalem for the Passover, the good um, Israelites were told, you go, you go and visit Jerusalem three times a year. And it was Passover, Pentecost, and the time of the final harvest. Um, <clears throat> so three times a year, Jerusalem was packed out. And Jesus and his disciples were told in, um, in John chapter 2, they went down for the Passover to Jerusalem. And this is, this is the first time that Jesus, as anointed for ministry after his baptism in the Jordan River, goes to Jerusalem. Well, what does he do? The first thing he does, he goes to the temple this is not Jesus meek and mild. He makes a whip of, uh, uh, of cords, of leather cords, and it drives out the, the money changers. You know the story. Overturns the tables, makes quite a scene. <clears throat> Nobody stops him. And John recalls this as happening at the beginning of his ministry. It seems to have also happened at the, towards the end of his ministry. But John, so it probably happened twice at the start of his ministry and at the end. And he cleared out making uh, the house of the Lord. Well, one translation puts it like a shopping mall. And uh, this house is to be a house of prayer, a house of praise a house where people can come and pour their hearts out to God. It's not a place for commerce, for trading, for money-making. So he overturned all that. And, of course, the religious people and the people in power in Jerusalem, John refers to them as the Jews. He, he reserves that name Jew for the people who lived in Jerusalem and around that area. And um, <clears throat> quite interesting, if you're in, into studying the Bible, Jesus called Nathaniel an Israelite in whom is no guile, but um, the way it's put in John's gospel is the Jews were the religious people and the self-righteous people and um, the people who from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry began to be upset and annoyed and indignant. What right have you got to mess with our nice, tidy, religious ways of doing things? It doesn't actually say this, but it wouldn't be at all um, unreasonable to think that maybe some of those Pharisees were also in business and uh, making a few pennies out of what was going on in the temple. Anyway, they were very annoyed with him for overturning the, the tables. Well, what right have you got to do this? And Jesus never answered people when we read um, the scriptures at the, at the level they were necessarily thinking. Jesus answers the heart needs not the head questions. So his answer to them was, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. And John does explain that to us. They were thinking about their, their bricks and their mortar and their religious ceremonies, and Jesus was thinking about the price that he would pay to reconcile human hearts with God. They thought he meant bricks and mortar. He was saying, you're going to take this temple and you will destroy it. But in three days, I'll rise again. 
Amen. Well, now we come to the story of Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, but he wasn't a Pharisee like some of these other religious guys. I mean, they were in power in Jerusalem. They, they, were, they had all sorts of authority. They were, uh, they were physically visible. Some, some here know that you can go to Jerusalem now about the time of uh, these, these ancient feasts, and there's still groups of people who they want to stand out. They, they, they dress a certain way. They wear their hair a certain way. They... they and uh, it, it's all showing off, really. It's all, uh, it's all outward. And Jesus, from the very beginning, was talking about the heart. But there, there were a few Pharisees who saw what Jesus was doing, heard what he was saying, and... Uh, Well, let's read about Nicodemus. Can we read uh, verses 1 to 8 of um, John chapter 3? Let's read it out together. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Amen. Very, very well-known passage. It's generally said, to define what we call evangelical Christianity. Well, we're not really very bothered about the label. It just means that this is um, the event where Jesus put in very plain and really quite shocking terms um, what must happen for any human heart to be a part of God's kingdom. You must, there is, there is no, there's no room for negotiation, none. You must be born again. That's what he said to Nicodemus. I love um, a, the story of one or two might have come across a preacher in the, uh, during the Depression era, a man called Billy Sunday. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Billy Sunday. You can find, if you look a bit carefully, one or two YouTube clips of Billy Sunday. He was an American tent evangelist and a fantastic character. He was a very lively man. He couldn't be imitated. He used to jump around and stand on the tables and all sorts of things. He was a very lively guy. He wasn't a great Bible teacher, but he led many, many people into a living relationship with God. And every time he preached, every time he preached, Billy Sunday would preach, you must be born again. You must be. 
And uh, there came a time when somebody approached him and they said to Billy Sunday, um, why do you, why do you, I mean, he put it in different ways, but why do you always um, take this as your text? Why do you always preach on, you must be born again? And Billy Sunday's answer was, because you must be born again. Um, which is lovely, isn't it? There, there is no room for ne- renegotiation by anybody. Now, Nicodemus was um, an important guy. We'll see that, that, that Jesus met all sorts of people. He met outcasts. He met people who were totally despised, who didn't fit, who... Um, who were rejected by others for different reasons. Sometimes it was their fault, and sometimes it wasn't their fault. But that, that's not Nicodemus. Nicodemus was, uh, was part of the establishment, um, a, a ruler amongst the Jews, uh, amongst the Pharisees, and obviously a bit worried about his reputation going to see this astounding teacher from Galilee, but he had an honest heart. So he came to Jesus by night and uh, he said, well, you must have come from God. You must, there must be something that you have from God, otherwise you couldn't do what you're doing. And uh, Jesus wasn't particularly nice or welcoming. He said something which shocked Nicodemus to his very core. He didn't answer his question directly. You must be born again. You must be born again, Nicodemus. And we can read Nicodemus' reaction. What on, what on earth are you talking about? What, what, what do you mean? I'm, 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 I'm an established figure. I have, a, I have a disciplined life. I have an organized life. Well, this is saying more than you've got to become like a little child. This is saying, you want to enter the kingdom, Nicodemus? You've got to, you've got to start again. You've got to become a nobody in your own eyes. You cannot be a part of God's people and hang on to your self-importance or your position. I'm not saying he, he, he did carry on being a Pharisee. We can see at the end of John's gospel that Nicodemus did hear and accept what Jesus said. And, and he continued in his, in his place by all account, by, from what we can work out. But you can't hang on to it. You can't hang on to your achievements. You can't hang on to your uh, position. In that sense, to enter the kingdom of God, you must become nothing but what Oswald Chambers put it this way, nothing but a breath. As as naked as, an, as a newborn child. That's, that's the, the, the attitude of somebody who is going to receive Jesus. Here I am. There's another old hymn, Just As I Am. And that's it. Just As I Am. Now, for all of us, it will be different. For some of us, it will be, I got to leave my, the things I think I've done well behind. For most of us, if not all of us, it will be, I got to leave behind the things I think I've done badly. I leave it all. I just come to Jesus with the breath that you've given me, nothing else. Just as I am, 
we won't sing that hymn today, but without one plea, but your blood was shed for me. Amen. Well, to be fair to Nicodemus, he was, he was shocked, he was perplexed. How, how can a man be born when he's old? I can't go back. How can this be? Jesus said, now listen, amen, amen. We read it as most assuredly. Listen to what I'm saying. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter God's kingdom, the place where he is Lord, the place where he rules and reigns in the heart and life of his people. That, that word, born again, a, a more accurate translation, and it is in some versions of the, the Bible, there are so many nowadays, it, it's born from above. Has anybody read the message here? Message is an interesting um, translation, and that's how Peterson puts it. And it's, it's a correct translation generated, born from above. It doesn't actually say born again. It says born from above. Fathered by God himself. That's the one essential condition of knowing God, of being part of his family. Somebody else put it this way, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He doesn't have any. He only has his own, fathered by God himself, by the Spirit, through honouring the name of Jesus. Amen. Born from above. Now, Peterson's translation, if you're, I, I, I won't try and read it out, the print's a bit small. But um, if you do have the message, um, it's a good passage to read in the message because he brings out some of the meanings of the original. And that word born is generated, generated, and it's the same word that we, we would find on the very first page of Scripture, Genesis. It, it's all the same origin word. <clears throat> and that's what's going on in the life of a heart that turns to the Lord. God is making a new creation. Just as the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. You know Genesis chapter 1 and how, how, how the, the worlds were made. They were made by the breath of God when his spirit moved and God said, let there be light and life. And God created out of nothing the earth in which we live. We have to be very careful in these days when there are so many voices saying well, it was this chemical reaction or that uh, explosion or big... Well, it probably was a chemical reaction or an explosion. But what we must never, ever lose sight of is God created. From nothing, God created. Now, you can maybe have different views on how it happened, but the point is, no, you are not a creature without purpose or without uh, an ending to, to, to 
a random life which is an assortment of chemicals that came together and somehow evolved, we must reject that idea. You and I and every human being were created by God with the specific purpose that we should learn to know him, to love him, and to dwell with him. And that is God's will for every human being that was ever born, including you and me. Now, there are lots of things we need to do in life. Of course there are. But that is the purpose for which you and I were created. Amen. And and Peterson's translation is, is very helpful because it points out that just as God created life and his spirit spoke and, and something that was not there came into being. That's what happened at the beginning. God made something from nothing. And that is what happens in the life of every real Christian believer. There was nothing there. There was a void. How did that song put it at the beginning uh, that we we, uh, sung? Who, 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 Who brings our chaos back into order? There was was darkness on the face of the deep at the beginning of the creation. And God spoke life and the earth stood up. That's how how it's put. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, anyone, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Thank you. Thank you, Chabba. If you're on the ball, I might try one or two more scriptures. A new creation. Amen. And old things have passed away. All things have become new, renewed by the Spirit. Well, Nathaniel, sorry, I beg your pardon. Nicodemus was, uh, he didn't know what to make of it. And questioned what Jesus was saying. So Jesus kind of repeats himself and kind of adds to what he first said. I'm telling you, Nicodemus, unless somebody is born of water and of the Spirit, he he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Don't be amazed. Don't be put off. Don't be offended. You must be born again. Now, there's a a progression in in what Jesus is saying. First of all, he said, "Unless, unless somebody's born generated from above, fathered by God... He can't see the kingdom unless unless the spirit of God moves in a in in a human heart. You can't enter in. This is the way to eternal life. Amen. If we've made a mistake in recent times about about new birth well not everybody has we um david porson has written a, an interesting book on it we've 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 over we've we've tried to box in and simplify something which is mysterious and wonderful and the basis of all life Um, let me test you out here. 
Chaba. Ecclesiastes. Wow. Have you got the Old Testament as well as the New? Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and, uh, see, and verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 5. It's not, oh gosh, you got there before me. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. This is uh, part of Solomon's wisdom. You do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. You do not know the works of God who makes everything. There's, there's something, there's a mystery and a wonder in what God does. I mean, what, what Solomon is saying here, I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but, but that what we call unborn child, God is working, God is moving. I don't want to get sidetracked into... Uh, angry debates, but make no mistake, part of our belief, proven from the scripture, is that a child in the womb is already alive, awake, and aware. That is our position. And if you say, well, just give me some evidence for that, just remember the story of when Mary visited Elizabeth. And what happened? At, yeah, the babe leapt in the womb. They were both in the womb. And, and the, the, the unborn child, John Baptist, leapt at, when he met, well, he was going to meet him much later on, but the unborn child, Jesus. So th there's no half measures about this. As, as people who believe in this book, we find that there is, there is life. Part of, so birth is, it's a process. There are crisis points, but it's a process. It isn't, it, we can't box it up and make it all neat. It's a process and, and it's a mystery. And there does come a point where, and I think mothers will be very grateful for this, when a child is delivered and, and, and brought into the, the, the air that that child was created into the element it was, it was, it was, it was created to dwell in, and that's a moment of deliverance. We tend to refer to that as birth, but that's a crisis moment in a process of new birth and new life and new creation. Let me let me try one more scripture because you're on the ball today. Titus chapter two. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. No, I got the wrong verse. It's definitely not that. <laughs> I'll have to check. <laughs> it's about the point where <clears throat> uh, God regenerates us by his spirit. I'm going to have to find it now. Just bear with me for a moment. <clears throat> it's chapter 3 and verse 5. Sorry, Chubba. Chapter 3 and verse 5. Let me, let me read what comes immediately before this. We, we were once foolish and, and disobedient and deceived this is all of us, serving different pleasures and lusts, living in malice and envy, wow, hateful 
and hating one another. That, that's how we've been, all of us. But then the kindness, the love of God, our Saviour, towards men appeared. And this is what comes next. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but a, to, yes, let's read it out. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. There it is. There it is again, regeneration, life brought about by the Spirit of God, <clears throat> the washing of regeneration, just like the earth stood out of the water at the very beginning and new life was created, so God, by his Spirit, speaks new life. Where there has been chaos, he speaks life into the heart of everyone who will become nothing so that God can do something in their lives. And, and what Titus is really speaking about there is the, 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 the glory of your and my human heart becoming a dwelling place for the Spirit. And it is a mystery, and it is a wonder, and, and we, we don't quite know how it happens. But listen, you and I were not made to be miserable and despairing and, and, and malicious and, and thinking not very nice thoughts about other people. You were not made for it. It won't do you any good. Your heart was made to be the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. That's what you were made for. We could put it another way, to be completely baptized, to be immersed, to be flooded out with God's presence. And that's what God because of Jesus, will do by his Spirit to any human heart that says, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. I, I might have been a bit of a Pharisee. I might have been trying to work things out for myself. I, I might have been uh, thinking that if only, if only I'm good enough, God will accept me. Not at all. Not at all. He comes to us and says, just have to be a little child. That's all. And this process of new birth and new life, it's ongoing. We could look at other scriptures which point um, <clears throat> in the right translation to us continually being being born again. What God has started to do in the human heart, he won't stop. He won't let go. He will continue at all times to sustain by his spirit anybody who will just come. Amen. Now Nicodemus was shocked. And Jesus kind of, in a way, he, he, he poked fun at him. He said, well, you, you're, you're a big man, Nicodemus. You're, you're a ruler. Amongst, you're a teacher. Don't you know this? Well, it seems that Nicodemus did not walk away offended by the message of the gospel. If you, if you turn towards the end, I didn't write the reference down. Somebody might know it. But towards the end of John's gospel, uh, two people went and collected after those awful events of Calvary. When, when something happened, we will never fully understand. But Jesus gave himself for us, gave his life, sacrificed everything 
to make this way to God for us. Well, after it all happened and those events occurred, two people went to, to Pilate and they, uh, they asked for Jesus' body to embalm it. And one, was, um, one of them was a man called Nicodemus. So from the little we know, amen, he heard what Jesus said and he took it into his heart. And that leaves us, we must finish now, but that leaves us with the challenge and the invitation. When God says to you and me, now, you've got to be a new creation. If you see it, enter in. Have you found the verse? Do you want to put it up? There you go. Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, this was probably daytime then. Amen. So he's got a bit bolder. Also came to... They, they, they didn't know. I mean, they didn't realize. They didn't need to embalm Jesus' body. In three days, he'd rise again anyway. But his intentions were good, and we are at least very clear that... Uh, this is a bit more bold than where he started. And he hung in there and clearly became a disciple of Jesus. Well, there we are. That's where we stand. How about you and me? I don't, I don't often do this very often. But are you gonna, are you gonna say, yeah? I want to be a new creation. Come on, I'm not a great, it's all right, we're not gonna have a tent campaign, but if you wanna say, I, I, yeah, I wanna be a new creation, raise your hands up in the air. That's what, uh, that's what we sung early on. I wanna be a new creation, I'm not ashamed of it. I wanna be a new creation. Amen, amen. Hallelujah.